Good morning. My name is Andrew. We know that what we do here is important, and we want to make sure that you have the best experience worshiping with us. If you're a visitor, I'm glad that you're here. Please reach out to one of the members of our guest experience team. They would love to see you. And if you're watching online, head over to live.pinedale.church, where you'll be able to connect with one of our online hosts. We know that there's a thousand other things that you could be doing today, but we pray that you will be able to connect and grow through this service. Let's get ready to worship. Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just Feel you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Feel you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. And the story isn't over If the story isn't good Failure's never final When the Father's in the room Failure's never final Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Pinedale Christian Church. So good to see you this morning. If you are a first-time visitor, if you didn't get a little gift when you came in, 
Please stop out at the Welcome Center when you go out. We have a little gift for you and uh, just some information about our church. And we're just glad to have you here today. Glad to have you folks online. Good to see you. I'm Kenny Foster. I'm one of the elders here at this church, and this is my wife, Connie. And what we want to talk about right at this moment is something very near and dear to our hearts, which is grandparenting matters. As you see on the screen, September 9th, which is a Saturday, we're going to have a seminar here, Grandparenting Matters. It's going to be held by David and Kathy Wheeler. David is a retired professor from Johnson University, and this is a phenomenal program. And uh, you, can't, you can't believe how good it is once you see it. And uh, the, fifth, the, doc, the tickets for that Saturday, and it's from 9 until 3, and you get lunch involved. The tickets are $15 for a single, $25 for a couple, and that includes your workbook and your lunch. And uh, it's just a great day, and I'm going to let Connie tell you a little bit about it. Good morning. Um, I had the privilege a, uh, last year at Johnson University to sit in the class with David and uh, Kathy um, on the grandparenting matters, and it was just a glimpse of what the seminar will be about. It's going to be a very, very powerful and um, informational seminar for grandparents, and not only for grandparents, but for the potential grandparents. If you're a mentor for um, children, uh, uh, children in your neighborhood, children here at church, uh, it's great information for you. Um, Kathy and David are both, this is their passion and their love for God and for children, and it just overflows throughout their uh, classes. Um, we we're looking forward to September the 9th, and we hope to see you uh, all there. And just remember, you know, God has blessed us truly with our children and our grandchildren, and it's our responsibility as grandparents to um, lay a firm foundation and lead them to Christ. So we're all on this um, journey together. We all want to be um, better grandparents, more intentional. Uh, you will reap benefits from this seminar that will open your eyes. It truly opened my eyes to things that I, I knew there was patent, uh, scripture about grandparents and how important it is, but all this will be brought to light to you. So we hope to see you all on uh, September the 9th, and we'll be on the spiritual journey and leave a legacy to our children and uh, generations to come. And Joshua 24, 15 uh, of five, um, it says, for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. And I hope this is um, for all of us and hope to see you all on September the 9th. So, how do you get your tickets? You can go to the website, go online. It will give you instructions how to do it. You can call the church office and reserve a ticket. But one of the main questions they're gonna ask you, that there's one question, and it is, what's your lunch, lunch preference going to be? That's, they've got to know that, so that Saturday you'll have your lunch waiting on you. So do that. If you're a grandparent, if you're about to be a grandparent, if you think you might be a grandparent, if you're that special aunt or uncle, you need to be here that morning. It is an awesome, awesome program. Now, turn your eyes over to the baptistry. We're about to have a pool party, speaking of our kids. Uh, what's up, y'all? Um, this is my buddy, Buis, and before I dunk him, I wanted to say a few things that was on my heart this morning. Um, Isaiah 55, 11 says, my word goes out, but it does not come back void. And in 2021, this guy started coming to church with me. He started really hearing the word of the, the Lord, and I saw a change not only in him, but in me. And as our friendship grew, it turned into a brotherhood, and it was really cool to be able to let my faith and his faith kind of be on the same path through parallel lines if you guys have been in math class before. It's really cool, you know, it never meets. We're always going in the same direction. And not only has he been a friend, but he's been a brother, and this is just awesome opportunity that I'm able to see him go through. Um, so, Logan, if you want to repeat after me. Uh -huh. I believe. I believe. 
That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. And He's my Savior. And he's my Savior. Now, Logan, because of your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. small group were kind enough to welcome me in with open loving arms and I've gotten to know Leah since January there's been a few things that I've learned if you know Leah you know that you laugh every time that you have an interaction with her I always leave filled up and full of joy whenever I get to be around her Another thing about Leah is she loves her people well. She's always the first to want to write down prayer requests, wants to hold hands with her friends while she's praying. And lastly, Leah is a leader. She is not afraid or ashamed of the gospel, and I know that she is going to share the gospel with so many people, and I'm just really proud of your obedience in getting baptized. So Leah, repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. He is my Savior. He is my Savior. And He is my Lord. And He is my Lord. Because of your confession, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We got a party this morning. This up here is Eden. It's my girl Eden. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of baptizing her sister. And, and now we get to do the same with her. And just wanted to reemphasize, we love you. We love your family. And let me tell you, I have never seen a middle school kid have a heart for the lost like Eden does. Um, just a few weeks ago at CRY Mix, I guess it was a little bit longer than a few weeks ago, but like we were sitting together, it was like 1030 at night, we were, it was about time to go back to our dorms, and she was just sitting with me weeping about a friend of hers that just doesn't know Jesus, and I definitely did not have a heart for the lost like that when I was in middle school, and so Eden, one thing I just love about you is your heart and how you follow Jesus, and I know confidently that you're going to continue to walk with him and do amazing things, and so it's such an honor to be able to share this moment with you, and we just love you so, so much, so repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. He is my Savior. He is my Savior. And He is my Lord. And He is my Lord. Based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Love you so much. Next up, we have my good friend, Mahayla. <laughs> Mahayla and I met during this last 40-day study that we had, and she was quiet and shy. And if you know Mahayla, that's actually not who she is <laughs> at all. She um, came to CIY Move with us this summer, and she really just felt the spirit working in her. She has gotten plugged in and connected and has an amazing community surrounding her now. And I pray that she just feels the love of Jesus. And I know the spirit's already working through her and the people around her so much. So <laughs> I'm just really proud of you during this time, too. So, if you'll repeat after me, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Son of the Living God. He is my Savior, He is my Savior, and He is my Lord, and He is my Lord. Now, baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We've got one more for you today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, this is exciting stuff. This is Grayson, and man, I love Grayson to death. He's such an encouragement for me. Once again, I feel like I've never seen, you know, middle school worship the way that you do. 
Um, he just, he goes all out for it. And I absolutely love your heart and the way that you worship Christ. And um, at CRY Mix this year, uh, he decided to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior for the first time. And how amazing that was to be able to have that conversation with you and to be able to lead you through that in small group. And he came to me a few weeks ago and says, I want to be baptized. I want to respond and I want to be obedient to what God is calling me to do. And so I'm super excited with how you're obeying Christ now. And I can't wait to see how you continue to do that throughout the rest of your life. And so I'm so excited for you and, and repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. He is my Savior. He is my Savior. And He is my Lord. And He is my Lord. Based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Join us in worship this morning.
far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea.
Well, good morning, Pinedale Christian Church. It is fantastic to see everybody here this morning, and I can't tell you how blessed I feel to be a part of this church body, a body of believers that understands the importance of what we're doing here, who understands the importance of being here every Sunday and engaging in this act of unity. Unity, which is something that let's face it, isn't something that we often face in our world right now. So I appreciate each and every one of you being here with us this morning. Well, we've come to the time in our service where we get to celebrate the communion of the Lord. And as we prepare our hearts, I wanna start by asking you a question. Why are you here? Why are you here this morning? And when I ask you that question, I'm sure immediately there's a couple different things that pop into your head. You know, for some of us, we come to church because it's Sunday, and let's face it, that's what we do on Sundays. That's what our parents did, that's what their parents did. Sunday mornings is for church, and that's why you're here. For some of us, it's because we live in a pretty dark world right now, and this is the only opportunity that we get to be in unison with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when Sunday morning comes, you jump at the opportunity to be a part of that unity. You come for the fellowship. I hope for most of us, we're here at least in part for the worship that we get to partake in, the act of praising our Lord. We're also here to learn something new and maybe remember something that we've forgotten. But put all of those reasons for aside for a moment because I wanna jump a little bit deeper. Because when you woke up this morning, that's not what got you out of bed. When you chose to come to church this morning, that's not what got you here. You're here this morning because you woke up with a purpose. When you woke up, you got out of bed because the Lord gave you a reason to live. He gave you a reason to be the light in the darkness, even in a world where that light often is not met with open arms. And that reason, that purpose that got you out of bed this morning, it doesn't just apply to Sunday mornings. It's not just the reason they got you to church, it's the reason that you do everything that you do throughout the week. When you get up in the morning and you go to work, while the paycheck is nice and let's face it, you have to have it in order to support your family, that's what God called you to do. But it's bigger than that. You go to work and you serve the Lord because you have a purpose, because God gave you a reason to live. And that reason is salvation. You get out of bed because you've been saved. Your sins have been atoned for, and because of that, you get to be the light in the darkness for Christ. You get to make a difference for his kingdom. And it's that salvation that we get to celebrate when we take these emblems. And we also get to take the time to remember what that gift cost. Because our Lord didn't just hand it to us, he suffered for us. His body was broken and his blood was spilt so that we would have a reason to live. And that's exactly what we're gonna celebrate right now. And by the way, communion is also a time for reflection because that free gift that God gave us, all he asks is that we ask for it. First John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So before we approach the table, take a moment in your seats to go before the Lord and confess any sins that may be on your heart that you need to put at his feet. Also take the time to commune with him and thank him for this gift that gives you a reason to get out of bed every morning. So take just a minute in your seats in silent preparation and then together we'll take the emblems as one body of believers. Luke 22, 19 says, and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you have the bread, let's take that together as one body of believers united in the free gift of salvation. Verse 20 says that in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
you'll take the juice with me as one body of believers united in salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I wanna thank you for everything that you've given to us, everything that you've poured out for us, Lord. I thank you for the purpose that you've given us, the reason to live, the reason to get out of bed every morning. Lord, I thank you for it. And I pray that you would help us to remember it every day, Lord. Lord, please be with the rest of this service. Holy Spirit, move in this congregation. Speak to us, Lord, and help us to obey. Lord, we love you, and we desperately, desperately need you. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. One more thing, Pinedale. We also get to take one more part of our worship service and dedicate it to offering. And this is an act of worship because God's given us so much. He's blessed each and every one of us way more than we deserve. And this is our opportunity to give back to him. It's an act of generosity, not an act of obligation. If you'd like to partake in offering today, there's a couple different ways you can do it. At the end of the service, there will be ushers in the back with bags you can drop physical offerings in there or in the drop box in the gym. Um, or if you wanted to give online at pinedale.church, that's an option as well. If you wouldn't mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking him to bless these offerings. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've poured out on us. Lord, it's way more than we deserve and we recognize that. And I pray that you would give us generous hearts, help us to give part of what you've given to us back to you to use for the glory of your kingdom, Lord. Lord, bless this service, be with us, and we pray all of this in your name, amen. Thank you, Jensen. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all, and it has been an awesome morning already. Man, those baptisms just kept on coming, and it is so awesome. I, can you, yeah, I mean, look, can we just thank God for what has already been a great morning? We've got a lot to do here, so I'm going to dive in while we get situated. So, obviously, we're doing something a little bit different this morning, and the, the bottom line is that for the past several weeks, we have been preaching through a series called Homesick. And during this series, we've been kind of leaning in on what does the Bible say about eternal life and how does that knowledge, how does what the Bible teaches affect us right now? And one of the things that we've really tried to press in on is this idea that according to Scripture, eternity is now in session. Okay, like because of what Jesus did on the cross, the reconciliation of all things, this whole broken creation, God is at work now, and he is already making us new, which means that you and I don't have to wait until we die to become new creations. We, can, we are actually like beachheads on this broken world of God's kingdom here. All right, so there's parts of eternal life we don't even have to wait for. But today, as we put a bow on this series, we're going to switch gears and talk about the part of eternal life that we do have to wait for. We're going to talk about heaven. And we're going to acknowledge off the top, the Bible only tells us a little bit about what heaven is like, but we're going to combine that little bit of information with a lot of sanctified imagination, and we're going to just do some dreaming for a few minutes about what it might be like one day when we get to heaven, or, or what your loved ones might be experiencing who are in heaven. And so, I want to approach this differently, and that's why I caught in some reinforcements. Um, some of you, many of you, I'm sure, know Bill McKenzie. Some of you don't, if, depending on when you started coming to Pinedale, but Bill was the senior minister here for almost 30 years. And he is a terrific preacher, and he is a great leader, and an important mentor to me, and a, a good friend. And so... It just seems so natural to me to, to invite him for this conversation. The two of us have these kind of conversations all the time. And what we're going to do today is just sit with you guys and have a conversation among ourselves and just do some dreaming about what, what, do, we, what do we know and, and what do we think we know about heaven. So as we get in, Bill hasn't been up on the platform in a while. Will you, will you welcome Bill McKenzie back to the platform, please? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm at my funeral here. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we like that guy now. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, Bill, I appreciate you doing this. And when, when I ask you to do, when I ask you if you would be willing, you, I was really happy with not only how eager you were to, to help, but also how, how important you saw this conversation as, as being. Why, why do you think this is so important? Well, on the tale of what we've done so far in this series on heaven, 
it certainly has an importance because I don't think we've done what we're doing today in the other messages, which is just daydreaming about what heaven's like and trying to apply the scripture. And when you start talking about this and so on, I don't know any other way to tell it the way I would tell it, about the grand, grandpa whose grandbaby came in and climbed on his lap and said, Grandpa, would you make a sound like a frog for me? And he said, yeah, I suppose I could, but uh, why are you asking me? And she said, well, Nanny says that if you'll make a, if the old toad rat feather will finally croak, then we'll go to Disney World. <laughs> I didn't say that very well, did I? Whatever. I still I can't believe, I still can't believe get, anybody get laughed at that. You've told yeah. that joke twice, and I'm still amazed that anybody laughed well, at that. Well, the fact of the matter is, some, <laughs> some people don't have a sense of humor, okay? That's <laughs> yes. Hey, look, this is, this, is, this is the reality of this stuff, okay? We all understand it's appointed unto every person who wants to croak. Mm. <laughs> Right. And there is a way to escape that if Jesus Christ returns before it. Otherwise, it's inevitable. There's no way. By the way, how old are you? <laughs> Thank you for asking, Bill. I am 49 years old. You'll be turning 50 soon, huh? Soon enough, That's half yeah. a century. You don't got much left either, bud. <laughs> Thank you. It's not just me that's the old people. You in know, I was going to point out that the reason I invited you is because you're the staff member most likely to get to heaven first. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then I was like, no, I'm going to be nicer to Bill than that. <laughs> yeah, and all the people said amen to that for sure anyway. <laughs> hey, look, we understand the fact that death is a, is, is a reality. And we have to deal with it somehow. And God gave us a means to deal with it. And, and it's this word heaven and so on. Put, the, put, put this, the first slide up here. Let me ask you a question. How many in this room right now have a loved one right now that you know is in heaven? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Is there, is there anybody that doesn't have their hand up? I, I don't know. Uh, all I can say is it looks like it's unanimous. Yeah. And why wouldn't it be? I, I can put my hands and my toes and everything up in the air because this is a reality for all of us. As you live in this world, your loved ones sometimes depart and friends. And if you're, they're, they're in right with Christ, they're in heaven. Now, here's the next piece. Look at this next one. This is what really means reality to what we're wanting to do today. Right this very second. Right this very second. This minute. What do you think? that loved one, pick one out. What do you think they are doing? And this, this, is, this is one of those moments and so on that some people say, well, I got an easy answer to that, and other people would. Me personally, I got an easy answer. My mom and dad are in heaven. And all I can say is I guarantee you on Sunday morning, they're in church. <laughs> if there's whatever they call it in heaven, they're there. And they're worshiping and so on. And then when that's done, they'll go eat at the country club and play golf this afternoon at <laughs> 2 o'clock. <laughs> because what I'm, what I'm saying is they're very predictable. But I see them doing stuff that relates to the world they came from. Sometimes we miss this point. We don't understand the fact that the afterlife is not something that is, that is void of its relationship to what God created in the first place with the Garden of Eden and all the other things that's happened since then. And that's the reason why when I talk about what happens to you when you die and what they're doing right now, I have a great confidence. I mean, I lose my fear of death. I, I know where they are. I, I know where they are. My, my, my father-in-law, Nelson, and, my, and Grammy, you know, Marcy's m m a mother. And, and these people that are precious and treasures to me, I know where they are because they were right with Christ when they left. That is heaven. And this is one of the things about God that I like. And I want to say this and I'll pop it back to you, partner. Sure. I think it pleases God what we're doing. It pleases him. Follow me on this. It gives meaning to what Jesus Christ did. These things that happened in this baptistry this morning, watching these kids make these decisions, listen to me. It gives meaning to it. Because what God is trying to say to us is, someday you're going to die, but you're saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved for what? Saved for heaven. And without heaven, living for Christ in this world is a good thing to do still. And yet it doesn't have any meaning in the eternal sense unless you're right with Christ. And then we know that there is a heaven, which is why I like this topic and so on. It's really meaningful to all of us. Yeah. So we're, our approach today is going to be that we're going to think through some, some questions and answers. And this is kind of the way Bill and I put this together this week. We, we were just kind of bouncing what questions would people ask about heaven and talking through some answers. And then we thought, well, let's just put these questions up on the screen and, and share some thoughts. But I want to make one warning before we start. I just think this is important to say up front. A lot of the stuff that we're going to share today is not things that are, are spelled out specifically in Scripture. So it's not that we're not standing on Scripture. I mean, we, we certainly are basing what we're saying in, in what the Bible teaches. 
but we are absolutely playing in the margins of Scripture. And so when we get done, if we said something that you disagree with, that's okay. Because here's one thing that we absolutely solid gold know about heaven. We don't know. All right, that we don't really know what it's going to be like. Paul said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. And then Paul said, no one has even imagined what God has in store for those who love him. And so what Paul's saying is, no matter how hard you try to imagine what heaven is going to be like, you're not going to hit the, the arrow in the middle of the bullseye. It's impossible. I mean, if I ask you right now, imagine your favorite color. That's easy. My favorite color is red. And if I try to imagine it, that's simple. But what if I said, imagine a color you've never seen? Can't do that. I mean, there's no way. You can't imagine a taste you've never tasted or imagine a feeling of wholeness you've never experienced. That's not possible. And that's what we're up against. All right, so heaven's going to be better than anything we're saying. So we already know that we're going to miss the mark, but we still believe that what we're doing is right, not wrong. And the reason is because of our goal. Our goal isn't to teach you a list of dogmatic truths about heaven. Our goal is to kindle inside of you or rekindle inside of you this desire to be with God because we need that. This world is so painful and that helps bolster us. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter four. And if you'll put that, that slide up, 2 Corinthians four, it says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. All right, this is, this is fuel for our faith. So let's just dig in, Bill, and let's just start with the question that it's heaven 101, right? But for anybody in the room maybe who would ask this, how do we know that heaven is real? We don't. We only know it by faith. Right. And if you have faith in Jesus Christ and faith in God's word and so on, then you know what you know. But if it's somebody that's not a believer or somebody from the world and so on, they can question this and, and try to somehow find fault with what we're talking about. But I think what we're talking about is exactly what God wanted us to understand. Number one, the Bible teaches about heaven from the beginning. From the first chapter in Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, heaven is infused all the way through it. In fact, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the heavens created three, three different levels of heaven. There is the heaven that we're living in right now, the atmosphere. The word in, in, in Hebrew means that. The next one would be outer space. And the third heaven, as Paul called it in Corinthians, is the heaven where God lives. And we want to have a place where God lives, right? We want to know where he is because our Father which art in heaven. And so that's the reason why our, our life is aimed towards that because we want to refix with him through the grace of God what has broken inside of us. So the Bible teaches it. Number two, also the fact that there's three people in the New Testament who actually saw it. Number one, first one was Stephen. And if you don't know that story, and after the church was birthed, the first person that was a martyr for the faith was a guy who was a deacon named Stephen. And they took him out in the streets and he preached a magnificent sermon in defense of Jesus Christ and condemning the people that were around him. And they got so angry they stoned him to death. And as he was dying, he said two things. <laughs> the first thing he said was, I see the heavens open and I see Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. He wasn't sitting, he was standing. But he says, I see him. And I think he really did see him. God rolled back. The, the, the clouds as far as the universe is concerned to see this. And then the last thing he said was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The same words that Jesus spoke on the cross, which is a testimony to the fact this is a man who got it. He understood what was happening with him. It's also like that Paul the Apostle saw heaven too. Second Corinthians 12, go read that later. Thorn in the flesh, God took him to heaven and said, you can't tell about this, words that you can't express. But he came back and he said, elsewhere, eye has not seen and ear has not heard what is conceived. He also goes on to say elsewhere and so on, but I put my trust in Christ and I aim my life towards heaven. Heaven was his trajectory all the way through. Last but not least, so this is a cool one too. Another person in the New Testament that saw heaven was John, John the Apostle. The entire book of Revelation is revelations of in times, in some senses, but don't go there. The first 19 chapters of Revelation is talking about the era in which God is living in heaven, the heaven we have right now, and a new heaven comes in in chapter 20. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
But the bigger picture is to understand the fact that heaven is therefore revealed all the time, all the way through the Bible, and it gives us a reason to believe in it. So it's an important thing. John 14, 1 is what is the best I mean, I mean the, yeah. the slam dunk is Jesus talked about heaven and promised it, and as he was on his way out, out to, to heaven, Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to comfort you this way. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I like that word instead of the word <laughs> many houses or rooms or whatever. I like mansions. Uh, my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would, have told, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And then my favorite line, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And sometimes I mean, that is heaven. Where I am, you'll be. Right. And sometimes he receives you through the doorway of death. In the end, sometimes they're going to sit by the rapture, and that's a whole other topic that someone will not get to. Now, get the point right now. If you got the trajectory on this, then you can understand the Q&A we're going to do, because each question is designed to try to get you to think a little bit about what it's like. For example, the first well, For question. example, I've, this is where we decided to start, because I think for anybody like me who's ever been in the room with somebody as they pass, one thing you might ask is, so what, what did they experience? What is the journey to heaven like? What, what do we know? So Bill, what, what would you say if, if somebody came and asked you that? What, what is the journey to heaven like? Of anything we teach in, in this message, I have the greatest confidence in the things I'm going to say right now because I do believe this is what the scripture has revealed to us. And, and I, I don't apologize for it. So what happens when a person dies? Number one, if you've ever been there when, when it happened, you might have experienced the same thing I've experienced. And that is, when a person dies, their body stops working. They don't breathe. They, the brain weighs flat. The, the heart's not pumping anymore. And, and all of a sudden, they have going on, in, as far as their life is concerned, no longer a, 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 the ability to sustain on this earth, which is the reason why somebody will say, well, they're gone well, they're not a goner, they're just gone. And the gone is right because number two, the spirit leaves the body. When a person dies, to be absent from the body is what the Christ said, to the, or Paul said, is to be present with the Lord. The spirit that we have leaves the body. If you remember over in the Garden of Eden when, when Adam was created, God, said, God first of all created his body. I mean, this is the last of his creation. And he created Adam, and then Eve is coming next. And, and when he created Adam, there he laid exactly like a, like a person that was completely healthy and alive, except for the fact he was still dead. He wasn't alive until it says God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life he gave him was his spirit. And as you go through life and so on, I guarantee you, you'll understand this, that our body can change a lot, and yet the spirit of the person doesn't change. The name you got when you were born is the name you still have. And also as you go through life and so on, when you are this tall or where you're this tall or where you're this big or whatever else you are and as time goes along, you still have the same name and the same identity. Why? Because it's the spirit that's who you are. Your body is just, well, as you said. It's, it's, it's temporary. Paul said your body is a tent. That's the word he used. That, that when we die, it's like we leave a tent and head for a mansion. He says it's like a journey. You're pulling up the stakes and moving on. So this is just a temporary shell that holds a spirit that's inside. So, and if you've ever had a loved one who, who was slipping away, you were watching them leave even as their body was there. Oh, yeah. In fact, I've, I almost have felt that, that since when my father died, it was as, as real as anything, and I've been around a lot of other people and so on. And Tyler, my son, and I both were standing there looking, and we could feel his spirit leave. It was weird, but that's how I felt it. Now, let me go to the next piece of this. When you leave, then what? What do you do? What happens? Well, the, na the answer is God does not say, well, just wander like a ghost through the universe. No, that's not true. Your spirit leaves, but there immediately is appearing to you angels. There are angels in the room. God gives angels to be our escort to heaven. And that's taught through several stories in the scripture and so on. When the beggar man died, it says over in Luke 16, Jesus told this story. He said, and the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom, which was what Jesus called later paradise. In other words, there was an escort to get him there, and deservedly, because it is an escort of joy and celebration. And also, they're almost like tour guides. So you're coming out. As the Spirit comes out, what is happening as far as their life is concerned? As the angels are with them, there is no delay to getting to heaven, but I don't think we're in a hurry. 
As your spirit leaves, I think you can look back and see what's happening on the earth. You maybe can see your loved ones who are grieving for you right now. And you will feel remorse and sorrow yourself because you're being separated from them. It's not what you wanted, but your body's failed you. As your spirit is leaving, your focus is on down and down and down. And as you get closer up to the sky, all of a sudden the angels say, no doubt down there, look up there. And you turn around and see, and suddenly like Stephen, the sky is open and now you can see heaven. And I don't know what heaven looks like exactly in in its totality, I know this much. You're going to see a real place all of a sudden that's in your eyes. And that is your destination. And suddenly suddenly you're studying this as close as you can. And there's no stopping off place, no delay as some churches teach and so on. But instead, you're going straight to God's house. By the way, there's also people who die who are lost. They go through the same experience. Their spirit leaves them, but they don't go up, they go down. Because the Bible says, Jesus said, wide or broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go that way. And narrow and straight are the ones that make it towards heaven and few find that. And the point is the few that find that are being escorted by angels into this place. And they are saved, saved to go to the Father's house in heaven. I like that phrase, Father's house. When we used to go home for Thanksgiving and dinners and so on at my mom's house, we'd, I'd always walk in, no matter what it was, I'd sling the door open, I wouldn't knock or anything. I'd say, honey, I'm home, because I'm <laughs> home. It was like, this was, this was family time and so on, celebration. And in heaven, by the way, you will reunite with your loved ones. Those who have preceded you, you will know them. They will know you. In fact, I think that there's probably like some big scoreboard that's in, in, that's in the sky that says, says, now arriving at gate 22 and so on. And, and there's a flood of people who know you, who are celebrating the fact, welcome, you're here and so on. And the or maybe party. they're going, Bill McKenzie, really? <laughs> I didn't see that I never coming. saw that one coming. <laughs> well, that's, be tr- that's actually more true than anything. By the way, you do have a sense of humor. Good that's boy, in there. It's, it's usually just mean. But, yeah. <laughs> so, so you reunite you with your loved ones and so on, and now you are in heaven. By the way, heaven is not your eternal destiny. In Revelation, the 21st chapter and 22nd chapter, it describes a new heaven and a new earth that's going to be built. We'll mention that in a minute, but I want to make the point. Heaven is not the end, but it is the same heaven that was created in Genesis 1. It's the same heaven that is in the sky right now. It will be the same heaven until Jesus Christ returns to the second coming and brings all things to an end. That will be the time in which a new heaven and earth comes. So, so what, what does heaven look like? Now, I'm, I want to press on this for just a minute because there, there's things we know and things we don't. You know, the best description we get, in, in Revelation 21, John talks about a new heaven and a new earth, and he gives, he gives this, this picture, keep, keep going over to, to verse 18 in this, where he kind of describes the city he sees, and he says, in this city, the city walls were made of jasper, and the buildings were pure gold, and the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. And the great street of the city was gold as pure as transparent glass. I mean, he gives this, this incredible, rich, shimmering image, you know? A couple things about that. Number one, John wasn't describing all of heaven. He was saying, here's this city I saw, all right? Secondly, these precious jewels that John saw, he's describing, I think, in the way that we could understand. But one thing that you need to remember is that jewels have no light of their own, all right? They just take light, and then they, they radiate it out, right? If you're in a jewelry store, they'll put a diamond on a black background or something like that, and then shine light so you can see it, it shimmer. Well, everything in heaven is there to radiate God's glory, all right, everything that you see radiates God's glory. And I don't know what that looks like, except I'll make this one statement. This summer, my family was at, at Kiowa in South Carolina, and we hiked down to the point where the Kiowa River runs into the Atlantic Ocean, and we watched the sunset. And it was unbelievable. And we stood for 30 minutes and just watched the sky change color, and the water was changing color, and it was like, man, God is an incredible artist. And we saw that on earth which is broken, which means that we only saw a shadow of the artistry of our heavenly father, of the creator. When we get to heaven, all of the veil is torn away. And what we're going to see is our senses filled in a way they've never been filled. God created our senses. 
but we're going, to, we're going to see beauty like we've never experienced. We're going to smell smells that, that are so delicious we've never, we can't even imagine. Like everything is the height of our senses. And that's what, when you ask earlier, like what are people who are there experiencing? That's what they're experiencing. I mean, their senses are just full all the time. Oh yeah, and, and it's, nothing, it's no, nothing that we have ever experienced. Whatever your best day that you can think that you've ever had on earth, it ain't gonna be nothing in heaven because it's gonna be better than that always because we're living in a world that's And that's not even the best part of oh, heaven, yeah. right? Oh, for sure. Because the best part is... Yeah, well, the first thing that's gonna happen when we get to heaven, and I like this piece a, a, a ton because this is one that if you don't already hunger for this, then you don't got it right yet. You gotta get it right in your mind because heaven is not a place to go live and see your loved ones that are there. That's there too. But the first thing I wanna do when I get to heaven is to see who? Who? Jesus, I want to see Jesus. I want to see God. And the promise I think that is implied as far as uh, the book of Revelation is, is concerned is it gives us an insight as to what happens in heaven all the time. Revelations chapter and four and five, I think give you a view of what it means to go into the throne room of God, where is the first place we will report. When we get into heaven and we go down the street, we're headed to the throne room. And we walk in and what do we see? I think this is a description of it. Revelation four. Revelation chapter four says, and I saw four living creatures who each had six wings and were covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come. And but, you know, this, that, that phrase and the, and the other one that comes after it is something that's an expression of worship. When I was a kid and I heard these verses and I heard this description and so on, I said, I'm not sure I want to go to heaven. An eternal worship service? Is this what we're doing? This is it? We up there and sing holy, holy? I mean, I want to do it for a while. But I'm, anyway, you get the picture. Keep going. I'm sorry. Whenever the four living creatures kind of did this, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worshiped him who lives forever. They laid their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Now comes the best part. And then, Jesus is there. Then I saw a five. Lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in Completeness of God is in this lamb. That's Jesus Christ. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. The scroll is the plan that God's going to do at the end of time, what he's going to carry out. And this scroll has written on it the last things of Revelation that are taught. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they were saying, we're involved in this. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive wealth, power, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise, and honor, and glory, and power. We read that for this reason. You need to hear it. You need to understand the presence of God. Jesus Christ, the one that died on the cross, who ascended to heaven, and we pray to him, and he lives in our heart, and all the things, suddenly, in the flesh, we're seeing him. What will that be like? All I know is this much. We'll be eating dirt that day. I think so, too. <laughs> yeah. Face to the ground. And then you'll get up and sing these praises and give glory, and that, to me, is going to be the thing that kind of sets the tone for everything that comes after that. Because we understand, this is all about him, and now, this is what he's done for me. And the whole circle of this and so on goes back to the day when kids like these did it in the baptistry and you did it in your heart and so on, you gave your heart to Christ. He took over and from then on, you're destined for this moment. Worship of the king, I love that part. So what are some things that will not be in heaven? <laughs> uh, we just made a list here. There will not be spiritual warfare no Satan and demons, no false religions, no theology debates, no denominations. There will not be 
temptation and sin or guilt and shame. There will be no doctors and nurses, hospitals and hospice, cavities and dentists, counselors and therapy, funeral homes, graves, graveyards, none of that. All out of business in heaven. If that's <laughs> what your occupation is, you're not working those jobs in we're, heaven. We're going to be out of a job too, you know. I know, no preachers. <laughs> <laughs> there will be peace and harmony in all relationships. No divorce. No family fights, no abuse, no regret. Amen, by the way. All the people say amen. No apologies. No bills or bill collectors. No home security. Yeah, you, don't have to, you won't have locks on your doors, okay? Your doors will just stand open. It doesn't matter because everybody's saved. It's all in perfect harmony. And Look at this next list. We won't struggle with, with social anxiety or prejudice or hatred. Murder, suicide, hungry, homeless, loneliness, boredom, drugs and drunkenness, emotional disorders, none of that. I mean, this makes my heart sing. No political debates. No, poli- <laughs> no, kidding. no police and jailers. No lawyers and lawsuits. No taxes or tax agents. No school shootings. No wars or weapons. No Tar Heels or Blue Devils. All the people. <laughs> We kind of covered that with no devils or demons, but we just thought maybe we'd, we'd put that back in there. <laughs> no, no anger, jealousy, wounded egos, depression, worry, grief. I mean, think about that. And we put no tissues, but you made the point last hour. It's not that there's no tears exactly. Oh, yeah. Right? Tears of joy. I mean, think about it. I mean, how many times have you laughed until you, cri- you cried? How many times have you ever had a moment that we were touched and so on, a reunion of a family, see one of those soldiers come home and everybody's crying? That's not tears of sorrow. And there'll be tears in heaven, but that kind of. So what, what will we do, Bill, what, when, when we get there? What, what do you think we might do in heaven? This is where we get speculative for sure because we don't actually have any my tenor, and it's laid out for us as far as the Bible is concerned. But here's seven things that we came up with that are kind of categories. The first one we've already covered. In heaven, there will be worship and, and praise and so on. By the way, one of the things is, is, is there will be contemporary praise. And, <laughs> no, no, stop no, I'm that. not. Stop that. Look, this, that it'll be under, interesting to see what music. Is there a pipe <laughs> organ in heaven? I hope not. Anyway, there's a lot of things that worship and sing God's praises around the throne with angels, and we'll do it regularly. It won't be done every day and every hour and so on by us, but we will be involved in that all the time. It's part of our life. You'll spend time with loved ones. And how often is it like at Thanksgiving time? Your kids go off to college and and you're scattered because everybody has jobs and you see each other every once in a while for a minute or two. And all of a sudden, everybody drops what they're doing and they come home. And you gather around that, you know, the turkey or whatever you all eat on Thanksgiving and the, the conversation, if everything's going well and the family is positive and healthy and happy and, and you sit there and say, man, this is just, it, this is it. Guess what? That's heaven every meal because we are reunited with our loved ones and we're living in this kind of perfection and it'll be a time of lots of gratitude and, and gatherings and fra- with friends and so on, right? I, I mean, it, it would just be the best. Yeah. If, when you think about the best meal ever with, with people around the table, just... It just keeps on going. You got number three. Um, we'll, we'll learn new truths. We'll, we'll be able to, to get answers to, to all the questions. Can you imagine being a scientist and suddenly everything's laid in front of you right there? Yeah, and also we understand the fact that, that, that when you're learning these new truths and getting these answers and so on, you're getting it from a legitimate authority. Always, 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 it's truth that's being spoken. And by the way, I think sometimes it'll be spoken by Jesus directly. Today, speaking at this particular service is Jesus Christ. And he's going to talk about it. And we all flood to it and say, oh, I want to hear Christ. You, know, and you never get tired of listening to what he might have to say. And can you imagine exploring the wonders of heaven? Oh, yeah. I mean, just, just out exploring and hiking. You look down through that list because we're almost out of time. But yeah. look at that list. I mean, everything up there is is not laying on a, crowd, a cloud and eating grapes, right? I mean, this is life. Oh, yeah. I, can, I can summarize in a quick order. You're going, you're going to have a real life with fun and happiness. You're going to also serve the Lord. Everybody will have responsibilities and so on. And we will be celebrating. I like this the most. We'll be celebrating the arrivals, the new arrivals of others until the end of time as far as the time of this earth. But we're celebrating and having parties and of special times because there are people that have come to know the Lord just like us. Heaven is not supposed to be an empty place, is it, sir? Absolutely not. So I want to ask you two, two or three questions that are just like one-sentence answers, okay? Number one, this is in your opinion. People ask all the time, can our loved ones see us in heaven? 
Like, like you know, can my, can my grandpa see me score a touchdown or, or whatever? You hear athletes say this all the time. The answer is we don't know, but I'll be honest with you. For me, it's okay. God has the ability to limit what you can see on this earth. And moments like that, or maybe the, the, uh, someone that got married or see these baptisms of their loved ones that are maybe already in heaven and so on, I got a hunch that God says every once in a while, come here, I want you to see this. You don't want to miss this. And opens a porthole so they get a chance to experience that. It's a taste of heaven times 100. I, yeah, I believe in that. Um, another question people ask a lot. Will my pet be in heaven? Like my, my, my favorite pet, will that pet There's be some ladies that are sitting on this balcony right over here, and I guarantee you, they won't come unless their pets are going to be there, okay? <laughs> so the answer is, of course they're going to be there. All the pooches, no cats, but all the pooches will be there. <laughs> so dogs, yes, cats, no. Yeah. <laughs> I just lost a lot of friends, didn't I? <laughs> Last one. Ever since my loved one died, I just find myself wishing I was already there in heaven. Is that wrong? Do you think it's wrong to miss somebody? No. So it's definitely not wrong to miss somebody as long as you got it in perspective. And the perspective is this, is that there is no order that we can all determine about when a person's going to leave. And when a loved one goes first, your heart will always be empty, but you can know the fact that they're there waiting for you. And by the way, they miss you. Just because it says there's no tears in heaven and so on doesn't mean they miss you, they don't forget you, and they don't miss you. And I'd say the other piece I would add to that is this one verse of Scripture. Look at Philippians, the first chapter. The Apostle Paul gave us this kind of seminal point. Let me read it fast. I said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And a purpose to life. For if I'm to go on living in the body, that will mean fruitful labor, labor for me. And yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you all for your progress and the joy in your faith. In other words, what Paul was saying was, is I have every reason to want to be in heaven. Let, take me, Lord. Instead, he said, Lord, use me. And when it's time, take me. That's what I think the attitude we always have. Miss him, but also serve the Lord. So we're, we're working overtime and we, we can keep going, but let, let's put a bow on this like this. So... It's, it's just stuff we've been talking about, just, just thinking through different parts of what could be. And one of the questions we were asking about ourselves is, do, what do you think, how do you think God reacts when he hears us talking like we're talking? And our conclusion is that God's smiling today for, for two reasons, all right? For one, I think that God smiles when we long to be with him. Okay, so when we, when we spend time thinking about what God might have in store for us, think about it as a, as a parent when your kids are trying to guess what you bought them for Christmas. You love it. I think God loves when we try to figure out, Lord, what will it be like? <laughs> because he knows it's going to be even better than we can imagine. And so that should bolster our faith so that we serve more diligently and live out our faith in expectation of what God has in store for us. But I also think maybe God is smiling today because he might be laughing at us a little bit because we're just like two kids up here talking about something that we don't even understand. And again, that's not wrong. Because one thing that we know that the Bible teaches, Paul said that there is nothing that we could ever ask or imagine that God can't do immeasurably more. Okay, like no matter what you imagine, God's gonna do immeasurably more than that. And so there is literally going to be nothing in heaven yeah. that's not better than it was on earth. All right, there is nothing on earth that you're going to miss one day in heaven because we're going to be in God's fullness. So the question to leave you with is just simply this. Do you have that hope? Are you ready for that? Do, do you have the hope of heaven in your heart so that when your time comes to leave the earth as it is appointed that everyone will do one day, that you know that you don't have to fear that but you can just anticipate what God has in store for you next. The devil loves to snuff out that kind of hope. Don't let him do that for you. Cling to it. Live with that kind of confidence. And don't miss heaven. Not for anything in this world. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thanks for the chance to sit with my friend. It's, it's like old times, Lord. It was a lot of fun. And Father, I just pray that you will take what we've talked about and, and bless it, Lord multiply it. Lord, let it, it seed something in all of our hearts so that as we leave today, we leave with our eyes on you, knowing, Jesus, that the best that we can imagine, that what you have in store is even better than that. 
And Lord, if there's someone here right now listening to my voice that doesn't have the hope of heaven, that doesn't have confidence that when they leave this earth that they'll be with you, that they have an experience renewal now. Lord, I just pray that this would be the day. And Lord, that you would bring that hope to life in them today. And Jesus, thank you for your grace. We ask this in your name, amen. If you have a decision, we have leaders who will be waiting right over here and you can meet us there as we stand and sing. Whether you're here in person or watching online, we are passionate about guiding you through your next steps. That might be praying with one of our volunteers or planning a visit for you and your family. Or maybe that's connecting to us through our social media or visiting our website, pinedale.church, to learn more. We are here for you, and we're glad that you've joined us today. See ya!